What's going on everybody? It's your boy Jason Arden from Mesa Studios, finally coming at you. And today I'm not alone, I'm with my friend and now kind of like co-producer Thomas Kennedy. Whatever yeah? we're doing, yeah. Yeah, working together on movies now. Mm -hmm. So finally coming at you with the interview that you've all been waiting for almost two years since the last interview. I was just, I was just thinking, that was crazy. Like when I like rewatched the first interview to like prepare for this, I was like, it's been longer like now, like since the first interview than like since like the first Desert Sands movie to like that interview. So I was like, crazy. It's been like two years. Yeah. Yeah. Almost two years on the day. Yeah. It was like That's back in crazy. February. Yeah. But here we are again. Thomas has got some questions. You guys got some questions. So uh, I guess we're going to get started right here. All right. Let's, I'm, let's I'm very excited. Yeah, two yeah, years so in the making. I. Yeah. So... As we all know, uh, Retribution comes out summer 2019. So when did you film all this? Because I remember when we talked about the first uh, the first Desert Sands film in the interview, you described kind of like a hectic filming process. You guys told me it was like the last week of summer. So like when when was this all filmed? It was pretty much the same thing. We We had planned for things to be a lot more organized and a lot better, but like... Really, in the end, everything fell apart, just like the first Disney yeah. stands. Like, Thomas and I, we went out and we filmed a scene or two in early early summer. Yeah. Right? We filmed like the fight scene in the barn and something else, but the rest of it was probably the last last month or so of summer. We we had to rush a lot of things in there. Yeah, and like I think that's just like the experience when like trying to make like a YouTube like feature length film like that. It's very hard to keep people together, even if it yeah. is the summer. It can still be tough, especially because you're not paying anybody, so you're just counting on them wanting to come help you're you just hoping that they'll show up out of the goodness of their heart so overall so you, you would say filming took about a week two weeks like how like because i remember you and i went in the beginning of the summer and then me you and patrick went another day so that was two days just with me and my stuff was short so like overall like how long was it probably like if i were to just take everything and just combine yeah. it all together probably like two two and a half weeks most likely I was trying to. I tried to be as efficient as possible with most things, and okay, yeah. Each scene was pretty much. I had the script. I had a separate printout of all the different scenes. Make yeah, sure I can cross them off one mm -hmm. by one, and we tried to just bust them out and get as many done and every day as we could. Like the scenes with me in the garage when I first wake up and Joe comes in, and then when we're here with Liz and my mom, and then the the scene with Jonathan or the Constance and yeah. and Kim like that was all in like one day really yeah like wow we, we just like that's like a quarter of the movie not so like an eighth it, of the movie but it, it was just, it was packed yeah is like what you're saying every time we did film like we didn't film all that much but when we did film it was like a lot in a small amount of time well let me ask you this just because of like how like hectic these movies are there any scenes that were in the script that did not make it into the movie I think there was one or two short stuff um like there I wanted to have a planning scene. Before the ambush in the woods, okay, I wanted to have a scene where we went back and forth between Damien and I, yeah, and we were telling our plans, and then the audience would be like, "Oh man, their plans are gonna collide, yeah. and they're gonna they're like, because each of us we were gonna think that we were gonna ambush the other one okay. while they were off guard, oh. but really it was gonna be like we were gonna collide in the middle. So mm -hmm. I I did want that scene. I think that was just a little bit too complex to film. Just like the time would have been just didn't yeah. work out for you either. And then like the spaces and like we wanted the final scene to be at the farm where we yeah. filmed the actual fight scene in the barn. So we had all the, the, all these like spaces planned out, but like we didn't get to film there, so it was hard to try to do that in the smaller garage and then yeah. all that stuff. But yeah, I think there was a few scenes that were cut out, but not like the first Desert Sands where they would have added to the movie. Yeah. It kind of... Well, that, like, okay. that seemed like it would have been like a cool scene, a good scene, but like... Yeah. I don't like like the necessity of it is not you know yeah it just would have been sometimes it is what it is with movies. So speaking of scenes, what was I'm just gonna get these questions out of the way early. What was your favorite one to shoot? Favorite, it's got to be the film uh, the scene where uh, where Kim comes and, and fights Jonathan. Jonathan yes. beats him up in two, like two punches. Yeah, <laughs> and then Constance comes and just knocks me knocks me out and drags me along that whole scene up until. Uh, Jonathan Apexi shoots Constance. I think that that was probably the most fun because we saw everything coming together and that was what we wanted the whole movie to be like because we realized in the first Desert Sands we didn't have all that much energy going through. It was kind of just talking the whole way. It was much more of like I think a drama than an action the yeah. first desert. Like there was a there was a lot more like heavy like character stuff mm -hmm. than like you know because the second movie i would describe as much more of an action movie than like the first movie was and that's exactly what we're like we were looking to have that like it, it could be its own climax but just like entertaining part 
that adds to the the plot of the movie right in the middle right in the beginning the first like 10 15 minutes so it was nice to see that come together it, it and it cool. is it's a truly like they're true like like truly like really good like action scenes not to say anything about like the first desert sands movie but like there's a one scene with you and and jeff in the bedroom like damien mm-hmm. where you like quick it's a cool move but like it's quick there's a scene where you go to the hills but nothing really happens there and in the ending like I would say the action in the second movie compared to the ending, even that, not even like the climax scene was much better than the climax of, if if you could call that ending, like not even the climax, just like that final fight scene in the first movie compared to that scene in the second movie, you could see how much you guys kind of up the ante action wise. Because the first movie, not yeah. that it wasn't like good action, but like I think Joe like headbutts a gun at yeah, one point. Just... It's mostly like grappling, but like this movie, like it felt like a real like action movie like fight. Yeah, man. When we put Joe's head in that door, like <laughs> oh, that was that's one of my f- favorite th- shots of the whole movie. Seriously, it's just like you, you could like with the sound effect in there, you could like feel it. It's just mm-hmm. like oh my god, my head. You know, it's just it, like it, I like that one. I I was actually that that hit felt more real than I think any other one that I I like of the movies we've made. Like that I've seen. Like it just felt like ow, like. Like you can like more than any punch, any kick, even like people like in the movies like getting shot like that looked like the worst. Yeah, it was that somehow just turned out great. I don't know how we'll try to replicate it in the next movies. Movies coming up, but that one turned out pretty good. Okay, now opposite side of the coin, least favorite scene to shoot. I think like the ambush scene was kind of difficult, especially because we had the same exact people on both sides, so we had to mm-hmm. film one half of it first. And then have everyone go and change, and then yeah. film everything else. How long did that take you guys? Uh probably like two hours at least, just for that like okay. quick back and forth, like mm-hmm. a minute scene. Yeah, because like what is it in the movie? It's like a minute, minute and a half. Definitely, yeah, something like that. It's crazy, but like, yeah, because I had I had everything in my head, and like, especially because it was pretty much just me working on that scene, especially, but most of the movie, like I had to figure out. I was like, okay, who's gonna shoot who, and what's the order, and who's gonna who's gonna yeah. live, and who's gonna die. And it was just. And was it a lot, was, so was a lot of that like planned out on the day? Uh, no, I had, I was a lifeguard at the time. So okay. the the days leading up to it, I would sit there and while I'm on duty, just I'd be, kind of I'd, thinking, I'd be thinking in the tower. Yeah, yeah, I'd be like, all right, all right, this guy's gonna die. He's gonna, you know, I'm also making sure everyone's like safe in the pool. Yeah, but, but like, <laughs> you know, um, yeah, I had a lot of time to think when I was doing that, so I was able to try to figure everything out what the best. But I, I had some really cool uh, shots in mind that I wanted to do. I wanted to have one thing where. Like someone's gonna go punch someone else, mm-hmm. and then they were gonna stop in real life. But it was gonna be like a freeze frame, like it was gonna look like a freeze frame on camera, and the camera would pan around, you know, like like one eighty degrees, and have them finish the punch. You know what I mean? Just like something cool like that. Mm-hmm. But like in the moment, it was just so hot outside. Like I had leather jacket on, everyone was wearing black. It was just so hot in the woods. So there are some things we couldn't pull off. But that was definitely the most difficult scene to film. We were all just wanting to get it done. Yeah, but I will say, though, at the end of the day, like, that scene, like, did come out very, very... Like, it was... I mean, it's like... It's just a good gunfight. Everyone's just getting mowed down. Mm-hmm. It's, just, it's just really cool. And it, 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 it felt like a real, like, ambush. And, like, it, it's one of... It sucks that it was so difficult to shoot because it's one of my favorite scenes of the movie. It's just a great action scene. Well, thanks. I guess some of the best scenes are sometimes most yeah. difficult because... Like coming up and and even like in Lackawanna when I've been doing different films, as you saw in the continuity project. Yeah. Like you see how all these different cuts put together makes things look so much more engaging and action packed. When it's like boom, boom, boom. You know, that's why like the Bourne series, like they revolutionized that kind of like shaky cam fast cut. Yeah. And they did it right where like you see you see enough, but you don't see everything and it just it just works. You know, when you have these long takes, yeah. like in Desert Sands, the original movie, everything's yeah. just a long, wide shot. Mm-hmm. Like, it's just like... Well, it felt more like it? theater than it did, like, uh, like a movie. And we did that, too, in the first Unlawful Justice movie. It was just, like, one take, let's just do it. But, like, the original Desert Sands, it's, like, it's a lot, like... And it works because it develops the characters. But a lot of it, it feels less like a movie and more like it's just, like, like a theater, like... Kind of, like, I think it would not be difficult to do, like, the original Desert Sands. It's, like, a stage, like, play with, like, you and Joe. Like, I don't think that'd be that difficult so it just kind of like speaks to how like much you guys like developed as like filmmakers in like those two years like how different those two movies and like not to like as you like as you know i'm a huge fan of the first desert sands but it's crazy like how what a different movie retribution is yeah definitely and i think that's just how you you have to work as a young filmmaker you you have to keep improving keep learning keep figuring out what looks good and what you should stay away from for the most part okay now i think we're really Getting into this. Right, so, beginning of the movie, 
Uh, we open in a Czechoslovakian forest, and there's a guy running through it. It turns out, like as we know from the teaser, it's the Wanderer. What made you start with the Wanderer getting shot? Because unless I'm completely wrong here, the rest of this movie is told in chronological order, but we have a time jump right at the beginning where it shows him getting shot. What made you want to start with that one? I was, I just kind of like the idea of having that flash forward, something interesting to capture the audience's attention before we cut back to talking between uh, Gavin Sable and Jonathan Apexi. I wanted something that was just kind of like, like, what just happened? Like, why am I seeing this? Okay. Pretty much. Um, that was supposed, there was supposed to be a scene where the the Sable group or the, the militia that was in Czechoslovakia, led by Damien Sable, the father, where they confronted the Wanderer and they were like, where is Andrew Green? Yeah. And then he just runs, runs away. And then okay. that was supposed to lead into why he ran away, which would then lead into what we saw in the teaser trailer. Uh, so would, so the, would both of those scenes have been in the beginning or would it have just him getting shot and then it would have been explained later when yeah. Damien and those guys ran into him? So when you first see it, you're supposed to be you're just running and you're like, what the heck? And then when, you're, when you see him face down, you're supposed to be like, oh, is that the face down guy from the trailer? Yeah. And then it would explain later why he was running away, what, why they want to mm-hmm. kill him, pretty much. I think it is a very well done scene, though, because... You have to see the teaser, I think, to get it. Because mm. later in the movie, it's just Oliver listening behind that tree while they like kill him for real. But it is very well done. It is like cool that like how it's shot like that. I don't, I don't know why I think it's so cool, but I just think it was a very good idea to do it like that. It's like a Tarantino style. Thing. I was I just gonna say it's Tarantino. Yeah, no, I was just gonna say that. So. I was like, I don't want to be like cringy, be like it's Tarantino, no, but like it is. Yeah, that, that was he was my inspiration for it, pretty mm-hmm. much. That's if that's what we're looking for. Yeah, Tarantino. But that was inspired. very cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, now another question about the wanderer did you include him just because he was in the teaser or was he like originally kind of supposed to have more of a connection to andrew definitely just the teaser he his name was the wanderer because that's just what his role was in the movie he was just walking and wandering around um so the story behind his character really is i was taking a road trip with darren aiden so damien sable Mm -hmm. senior and then aiden was supposed to play the wanderer but he backed out last minute, so I had to play him in the actual movie. But we were talking about the first Desert Sands. This was in the middle. This is right after the, or this is a year after the first Desert Sands. Okay. Right before the teaser was released in the turn of 2019 or whatever, whenever yeah. it came out. Um, so we were talking about the first movie, and then they were like, yo, we should make a second movie. And I was already thinking about making a second movie. Yeah. So I said, all right, let's do it. And then they said, let's just let's film a, a trailer out here. So yeah. I, on the fly, I was like, okay, finally some people <laughs> interested in filming things because it's so hard to get interest in this area. Yeah. And we had the creepy driveway with the headlights mm-hmm. and stuff. And we said, okay, let's just film something really weird and creepy. And we filmed that. And then I just kind of had to fill in the rest of his, the blanks for his character on, on why everything was happening the way it was. Okay. Because I was going to say, I remember when you talked about it in the first interview, you said Darren like had like... Darren Pitts, the actor for Damien Sable Sr., he said like he had ideas like about it, but like he said his specifics were like all over the place. Yeah, that's pretty like, much like in terms of continuity. Yeah, that that's mostly what happened. Yeah, but it's yeah. still very cool, and I do. I we're gonna talk about him later because I really do love that character. Yeah. So moving into the movie now, we get our first scene with Gavin Sable, Noah Leedy. What inspired the character of Gavin Sable? Was that just um? Just because of those, like that three brother thing that was kind of mentioned in the first movie, but then kind of like went away. Because I remember, I don't know if we discussed it, where you shot a scene with uh, the Norton brothers, and like it just didn't work in the movie, so it was cut. Was Noah just put in there to fill that gap? Yeah. So the Norton brothers, and that scene, that was why we said there's three brothers because we plan on having them in the movie a yes. lot more than the. Well, we didn't have them at all in the first movie. Um. So that was why we mentioned three brothers, and then we did fill have Gavin there and Oliver to fill that three brothers because everyone was like three brothers like whatever I, yeah so I think it really to... confused some people because like there is a scene where he's talking about it's like we got these three brothers and then the, the next scene Joe's like oh we got a new recruit named Damien so I think it just like I think it was a good idea so that's like where he came from pretty much but then also his character was there to introduce or to talk about some of the flaws of the final scene from the first movie yes like when when Damien wakes up and it's just him and me, it's like, oh, where'd Joe go? Or where'd mm-hmm. Apexi go? And then when you hear the quad in the background yes. and all that stuff. And on top of that, so he explained a lot of what happened in the last scene. And then he was also there to create the confusion, to plant the seed of the Damien's. Because mm-hmm. when he t- he's, he's talking about, 
No, can you uses... can you explain that? Because I think yeah. like I understood it because you explained it to me beforehand. Can you explain to everyone like what happened and how he confused? I, he didn't do it intentionally, right? Well, in the script, he did. Did he? Yes. Oh, that was the so so what? Well, There's a whole other thing we got to talk about then because I didn't even realize this. That that's how it was meant to be. So so Gavin Sable was still a bad guy in the second movie. No, Gavin Sable was good. Oh, he was good, but he was just trying to confuse Joe. No, he wasn't. I mean, like in the script, I meant like I write it. So that it would be confusing to the audience. Yes, okay. But yeah, can you walk us through that now that we're like at the end of it? So pretty much what happened was he started talking about Damien the son. Okay. And then he transitions into his father as the leader of the Black Hills and then how they started working together. And then he goes, and then then I think uh, Ipexi cuts him off talking about Andrew. Yeah. And then Gavin says, he's still out there killing people. And Joe thinks that he's mm-hmm. talking about Damien Sable, the, the son. Yes. But really, he's talking about the father. Okay. So, Apexi is like, well, Damien's dead. Whatever. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't care about this. So, it was basically just meant to confuse Captain Apexi, if that makes any sense. Yes. Yeah. So that he would think that there wasn't a father, that it was the old Damien. Blow off Gavin Sable, whatever. So, like, for a second there, I thought you meant that Gavin was like, oh, I'm going to confuse him and make him think, like, my dad's not out there. So it was, oh. can I, was Jonathan totally in the dark about what the Black Hills, and they are still the Black Hills, right? Yes. Was doing in Czechoslovakia, like he had no idea up until the events of Retribution? Yeah, he, he thought that it was just done. He thought it okay. was over. And then after like, Kim came and attacked him um, on behalf of Damien and the Black Hills, after that happened, we have the conversation and he's like, well, we got to get over there and stop him. I think he had the realization then that, that Gavin wasn't talking yeah. about the son, because the son is still dead. Yes, he's talking about the father. And another, just I, I, I hate to keep jumping, uh, con- like into the movie more, but just a quick question about Kim. I don't think it really like ruins the order I'm trying to do here. Was Kim always uh, a bad guy, like when he first tried to join Desert Sands, or was it the rejection of Jonathan towards him that kind of drove him towards that path? Yeah, I mean, I would say it's definitely the rejection. Okay. Um, there obviously isn't much about Kim. Like we never really hear about him before yeah, or after. Or after, yeah. But I would say I think it makes more sense that Jonathan rejected him from Desert Sands, so he said, well, screw like, this." Yeah, I never understood if he was like a sleeper agent, like in the same way, like not a sleeper agent, but like a, a double agent in the same way that Damien was, mm-hmm. or if he was just some like guy who was like Andrew. He's like, "Oh, I, okay, this is a good way to make some money. I'm going to join up." And he just Jonathan's like, "We're done. We're not doing this anymore." Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing as Andrew. Okay, but but then he gets yeah he gets denied, so mm-hmm. he's like, uh, "I'm just going to go." fight against him now so that uber scene where gavin sable goes see uh, a pexy was that all just uh improv i mean i think improv is like a decent word uh it was just we went uh line by line pretty much so we went back and forth like abby said one thing or the uber driver said one thing and then gavin said one thing and they were like all right what's the funny thing to come off of that you know so it was pretty much just we took a car ride around scranton and And they just tried to now the Uber driver, Abby Cosgrove. Cosgrove. Was she in the original script or did she want to be in the movie? Was she approached to be in the movie? I forget what the She does a good job with her part, but like you could tell it's improv. And like I was always very curious about the scene the first time I saw it, and I still am, like now. I think what happened was I wanted to make a joke. The whole reason there's an Uber scene is because I wanted to make a joke about the Liz Wiz diss track. Yes. Because Liz was also okay. in the movie. So this was all written around the Liz Wiz diss track. Pretty much, yeah. And Abby was just like <laughs> she was like, Oh, I'll I'll do it. And so I was like, all right, cool. Like it didn't it didn't matter who played the role i think abby did it great oh i thought you she did I mean? fine yeah, yeah but uh, like, so, i i love that it was written around the elizabeth's diss track pretty much. i think my favorite part i think <laughs> yeah. of that scene now is that i know that i think the only problem is that it's so meta and so fourth wall breaking it's just like how do you explain like contraband exists in the uh, dream uh, it, world it, it's you very know? funny though because yeah. like when noah's like i actually found it to be very artistically creative and <laughs> intelligent like that's funny stuff this is the way he says it yeah and noah like he is a very good like I loved having him in Unlawful Justice too. Yeah. He's a very good actor. Like he can like as, like like he's a very good actor. Like all the time. But like there's certain scenes where he's just like so funny with like some of the stuff he does. And like that was one of them. Yeah. No. Was, I wish he's so good. I wish I had him in more scenes in, in yeah, Retribution. Yeah, I just, I'm I'm very glad I got him for Unlawful Justice. I think I have my next question is uh, about that. It. So what happened to, to Gavin? After that, he just like opens the garage door and he's gone. Yeah, I, it's just as I said, things were rushed so much in production. 
basically what ended up happening was everything I wrote for the script was just plot based. Okay. So it was hard to get that kind of character development in because to, to think about all their backstories and stuff, you have to have more time. And I just didn't give myself enough time. So it was like, well, he's going to be in here for this, for the confusion, to explain some things. And then it was just like, I don't know what else to put him in. So, he so was he not in the away. original script besides that? Oh, I think he was. He was. Oh, he was? Yeah. He had other scenes, but he was just, you know. Oh, no, not in other scenes. No, just okay. that one scene he was in there. Okay. And then, yeah, as I said, I wish I could have had him in more scenes. Yeah. If I had. It was great. He, he did a really, like, like in both movies, he did a fantastic job. Yeah, he was a great. great so job. moving on from that, in our last interview, you said there will not be any, uh, speaking of, like, female parts in this movie, because there are quite a few. There's way more than in the first uh, Desert Sands. There's the Uber driver. There's... Um, Betty, there is obviously at the end your mom. There is, I mean, it's a smaller part, but the girl on her her phone. Yeah. You said there will not be any scene actresses, but there will be a voice on the phone. I was assuming you were referring to your mom. Yes. And Joe seemed to back you up on that. He was kind of like, I don't think we have any really any parts. So what changed? How much did the script change from our last interview to production? Well, what ended up happening was I started having a little thing with Liz, which didn't work out in the end, but. I was like, oh, you know, I think I should like write you in. I think that'd be cool. We can work on this together. Because one of the main reasons that we never worked with female actresses is just because like it's a little more uncomfortable. You know what I mean? Just as like a amateur film producer that we don't know exactly what we're doing. So like if we're just with our friends, it's like, ah, oh, we'll figure it out. You know. But like when there's a female around, it's just kind of more like you know what I mean. It's just a little more tense. You're trying to figure things out on the fly. You can't think as well just because we're guys, teenage guys. <laughs> you know what I mean? But um. As I went through writing the script, I realized that I wanted there to be some sort of conflict between Apexi and Green. Yeah, which I do want to talk about. Like, I did have a question about yeah. that as well, but like, I'll save that one for later. Yeah, whenever you whenever feel necessary. But I did want a little bit of a conflict between the two of us. So I said, well, he gets a girlfriend, and then I'm also into her. I mean, it's an easy love triangle. And it, it's, I, you know, I've, I've since learned that it's kind of like womanizing, I don't know if that's the right word, but just to have females play a role just to be fought over by men. Yeah. You know, and that wasn't exactly what, it, like, she was also the caregiver, so she mm-hmm. was going to deliver the news for about my mother dying. Well, I that. think, like, in your case, the movie is just so, sh- it's so short, like, it's not, it's a feature, it's 43 minutes, but, like, it's short enough that, like, you can't really, like, outside of your main characters who were introduced in the first movie, there's not that much development that, like, really could have been had with, like, uh, the girls. Yeah. That's pretty much it, though. But yeah, I wanted her to have there to be a conflict between mm-hmm. Apexi and I. So the point of that love triangle—well, that was the question for later, but you pretty much answered it. So the point of that love triangle was just—is the point of her like the point of her character was just kind of to create cl- conflict between you and Jonathan? Yeah, and then it were, uh, ended up working out pretty well in the end, where it gives me a reason to storm off before Apexi can mm-hmm. tell me what's happening with Damien Sable and all of that. Uh, yeah. Because I'm upset with him. Well, yeah, and then also, yeah, you need that for the end. Uh, Liz Hakus, though, very, very good job. Oh. She was a very good actress in the film. She did great, yeah. She's just, like, well cast for that role. I thought, like, her scenes with you especially, she's very good at kind of, like, conveying that she just, like, wasn't interested. She, 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 honestly, I think it was, it was the reality of the situation, you know? Like, yeah. she wasn't actually interested in me in real life, so it was just... But I, I thought, like, I, I, yeah, when I remember yeah. when I was watching the movie, I was like, yeah, oh, very, very, very good job. I want, like, to say, right, like, right now, like, whole cast like a whole ensemble great great job like acting wise you joe and jeff especially i want to say jeff his mm-hmm. monologue at the end is fantastic but yeah. whole cast like great job i'll just get that out of the way right now well, thanks Appreciate very this good is about unlawful justice series i'd say the same thing to you guys but <laughs> unfortunately it's not what it is we gotta but stay like, on track. i like even like from the first movie like the acting quality like within you like you three went up mm-hmm. yeah two years of experience mm-hmm. we as I was saying before, that we saw kind of what worked and what didn't work in the first movie, and we improved on that. So mm-hmm. it definitely helped us in the long run. Got it. For Got the longevity's it. sake. Now, uh, I want to ask you a quick question about the plot of this movie. You said it's kind of the story. So we now, like, we're jumping all over the place, but we get to our first scene with Joe now. Um that's where we're at in this. We get to our first scene with Joe. He's very depressed over like the death of Andrew, the death of Andrew. And you said in our first interview, it's kind of the story of Joe getting retribution for the death of Andrew Green. So I got to ask, what what changed between then and like when production happened? Because like I, Joe has a good part. It's a decent size. It's not his story. 
Yeah. Yo, well, yeah. Um, it definitely it, it originally was supposed to be all about him, especially his movie. Um, but I think it's just with the introduction of Andrew Green into your universe, the Unlawful Justice universe, I needed him to stay alive and I needed some way to have him stay alive. Because I, I, I did want him dead. I wanted to, I was done acting. I wanted to stay behind the cameras, stay behind the scenes, write and record and all that and edit. But I didn't want to be on screen. But then, you know, people also demanded. They were like, oh, Andrew Green is dead. Yeah. And then it was just, it was hard to write around Apexy in a sense. Because the whole whole first movie was based yeah. around uh, Andrew Green. So it was just hard to try to expand off of his character enough to make a whole movie about it. And I think we could have pulled it off. But I did need Andrew to come back. Yeah. And it just kind of worked out that that's how it is. Oh, I don't if, even know how long the movie could have been without Andrew. I don't know either. We'll, just, we'll never know, I guess. Mm-hmm. But before we get to the next question, I want to take a quick break to thank our sponsors, the people that are helping us out for these interviews and all that. So we are right back. So quick disclaimer, if you've made it this far, thanks for making it this far already. This was supposed to be a video podcast, if you couldn't tell. And, well, things just kind of went wrong. A lot of the focus was messed up, and it just didn't look professional. So, this is supposed to be an ad for Jeff D'Angelo Design Group, a video ad. Instead, I'm just going to shout him out. Jeff D'Angelo Design Group, he's on 631 Prospect Avenue in Southside. He makes a lot of props and set designs, so if you ever need any help with any of that kind of thing, just hit him up. He's on Instagram, he's on Facebook, or you could show up to his place during office hours and say hello to him. He's a nice guy. If you need any props or set designs... Jeff D'Angelo Design Group is the way to go. All right, welcome back. Thanks to Jeff D'Angelo Design Group for helping us out. Let's get right back into it here. Let's do it. So I just want to say, this isn't even a question. Uh, that shot of Joe coming downstairs um, in the background with a root beer can in the foreground. I love that shot. That's yeah. so funny. I don't know if we talked about it before, but root beer was kind of like a theme in the first movie. Well, I remember every single scene you guys are drinking anything. It's a root beer. That was the whole point. And then they're in so many different other scenes. There's just root beer in the background, like mm-hmm. on a table or just in the trash can or whatever. Like there's root beer everywhere in the first movie. And part of that was because we were drinking root beer all the time. Yeah. But at one point we were just like, yo, let's just make it like a thing. Why I like all the like it was like root beer like it felt like it was product placement for root beer <laughs> pretty much yeah so that was the reference but the retribution we wanted the root beer that is like a like if you like watch the first as a tense you pay attention that's a hilarious shot that's fantastic yes good a good callback now can I why is Betty how did she wind up with Jonathan if like he's at like this point in his life if he's like so down and out I don't even know that he has a job like what made her and him get together that's a good question I, I, it's something i haven't thought of um <laughs> you already started started me off the second half with the, the second half. question i mean i don't know sometimes people i, I guess they put on a fake part of themselves for mm-hmm. relationships maybe maybe she was helping him get back up to normalcy maybe she saw him and she if she is a caregiver so maybe she was yeah. giving him care and then they fell in love yeah I don't know, but I, 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 I do like like it's not none of it's shown on screen, but I love this whole angle that like a Pexy like take care takes care of Andrew's mom and like he meets like this girl who like he hires to, like that feels like a Hallmark movie if like you ever made it. Yeah, like that Pex- feels like what would happen is like this guy died and like the army I like, need you to take care of his mom and, like they fall in love. That's hilarious. Yeah, I mean a Pexy was a nice guy. He, uh, he saw potential in Andrew and no one else would, and they bonded over that. I guess mm-hmm. I don't know, but yeah, that is a pretty interesting dynamic now why did gavin going back to now gavin shows up to the house and pexy goes like out back why did gavin wait so long to go see him um and even if like andrew's not awake why didn't he want to tell him that like hey like he's like we have him he's safe like like what why like what what was like his like process there i think it's just cinematic timing yeah fair enough we just wanted him to wake up the mother to be dead and then for everything to start back up again with the black hills corporation Really, there's no answer for that either. I guess you can say that the Black Hills took a break mm-hmm. and that he wanted to go inform him about Damien. Because I don't think Gavin really wanted to bring up Andrew. Yeah. But he used him as a way to keep Jonathan in the conversation. Oh, so that was more of like to get Jonathan like back into things. Because he was, Jonathan was about to leave. And mm-hmm. he goes, what if I told you Andrew's still alive? Okay. Just because like he won't have that in like, his back pocket in case okay. something ever happened. So I think the, his main reason for going there was to say that Damien Sable was out there killing checks. <laughs> <laughs> um 
in the next scene, Joey and uh, Noah, Gavin and uh, Jonathan, they go to the uh, the like the warehouse, which is basically it's here uh, where where Andrew is being like uh, like nursed back to health, and like Joey starts talking to you, um, and like he like goes to say he's like some of his dr- maybe he's like Andrew, are you having any bad like dr-? and like. I like I know because you told me he's supposed to be saying the word dream. I don't. Can you maybe like explain that to like everybody like what was going on in that scene? So yeah, what I was looking for is him to say more of like dream and like not being able to say the M part of it, mm-hmm. but he kind of just like didn't say anything. So it was more difficult to try to figure out what he was trying to say. But basically, yeah. he was trying to hint at the fact that it all was a dream, just because like when you're in a dream, you usually don't realize it. Yeah. So for someone to say the word dream to you, if you're in your own dream, it might be like. It might wake you up, or you know, like it might become lucid. Uh-huh. So that's kind of what we were going for. Like he, either he knew he couldn't say it, or he just physically couldn't say it because they yeah. were in a dream. And then Andrew does say dream later on. He starts talking scene. about it. But in that aspect, I feel like he's in his own dream. He is the controller of it, so like he can just say it. It doesn't sound as bad. Like uh-huh. if someone else says it to you, I mean, it's a whole thing. But little, little fun fact: there are different dream words out there in the uh throughout the movie what do you mean like if you notice when i after i do mention dream in the background in um little magnetic stickers says dream big jason oh and i remember behind the bed it says behind the dream bed, the dream in big bold letters yeah. so uh that's basically more hints at yeah. the father in dream and then the jason part and then there are because, there are a few like Easter eggs throughout the movie as well. Like there's that script on the counter, like when yeah. like you make the mac and cheese. But I never realized that it said Dream Big Jason. Look out for it after I say he was gonna pay the bills and do the dishes. And Dream Big Jason because he's in Jason's dream at huh? that point. He's still Andrew, but he's in Jason's dream, who was in Andrew's dream. Mm-hmm. We'll get to that in a little bit. It's a bit confusing. Yeah, it definitely is. But then yeah, then the big dream in the background. There's st- that was after he woke up and he was Jason Arden, but they're still in a dream. Mm-hmm. Now in the with the Inception d- music oh. in the background. Sorry, you cut you off. no, you're good. Inception music in the background, just for those Inception people know. Uh huh. Oh, it's still a dream because they don't know. Okay. Now, why did you decide to kill off Andrew's mom in like uh, the, the in the dream world of the second movie? Dude, like, what was the purpose of that death? Yeah, just one of the, another reason for him to start acting passionately. Okay. Which we're gonna talk about in a little bit: passion versus logic. Yes. But because uh, at one point he says, "I wish I could have told her I loved her one more time." You know, he's all sad. And then in the end of it, she's sick and he goes back and he says, I love you. Yeah. I don't know if you noticed that part. Yes. But that's so that it's one reason for him to start being like, it's time. Because like a, a logical thinker might be like, oh, she's going to get better. It's fine. Whatever. But if you're thinking with like your heart uh-huh. and your soul, it's like, well, I can go to this interview and she can come. I can come home and she could be dead. Yeah. So I love you. Before I love I leave. you. I never thought about that before. Well, no, very cool. You and you are very good with that, with like keeping the themes that you like. You pick a theme and you stick to it, like throughout your movie. They're very like that's tough. Like it's like someone's like written movie, like written movies, but like YouTube movies. Like it's tough to do. Same. Yeah, it, it definitely is hard, especially when there are things that don't line up with what you're doing and they just yeah. accidentally come out. But that's how it is mm-hmm. as an amateur filmmaker. Was your mom alive in the original script? When you talk about a voice on the phone, was that the voice you were talking about in our first interview? Well, I think, I don't know if I said it before, but we didn't have a script at all in, okay. in, the, in the first interview. Well, you mentioned, though, there, there will be like, there will be no scene actresses, but there will be like a voice on the phone. I remember you like you showed me that notebook where you wrote everything out. Mm-hmm. Was she alive in those notes or was she always like dead? Was there another actress who was on the phone? or? Yeah, it, it was supposed to be my mother on the phone and she was supposed to be alive at the time. I forget what the whole reasoning was behind that was, but a lot of things changed from the well, interview. Well, it, it was a lot. So. I, like I said, I wanted to like follow up uh, from that interview. Yeah, so that, that's pretty much what that is. It didn't really come, didn't really turn into anything. And I, I I know the answer to this question, but I do want to ask it to you just to get it on the record. When you find out your mom's dead, you go out and you're like, "Who's gonna pay the bills? Gonna wash the dishes?" Joe comes in. You guys go in for a hug. Uh, I thought that moment was like a self-aware like wink at the camera, and that was that moment was supposed to be like taken seriously, correct? Yeah, it was, it was 100% okay. serious that moment. You didn't, you thought it was supposed to be a joke. I thought it was, I, I thought it was like, okay, we're doing like a funny scene here now that the mom's dad were trying to lighten the tension because like I just thought like it, like it was so like dramatic. It was like we like you like cut like you and Joe like went black and white. I was like oh, and like and then like you did like the scene with your mom and like the beginning of the first movie. And I was like, this is 
I, I could not tell if you were trying to play it for last or not, but like, I just want, like, I know like you already told me that it was, but like earlier, like before we did this interview and asked this question already, but I, I, I was like, I want to get it on the record that like I screwed up on that. No, it's fine. It was supposed to be taken totally seriously. It's like, your mom's dead. <laughs> Time for you. Um, you know, I, I can definitely see because there's a lot of satire out these days yeah. that like make fun of well, dramatic. I stuff. think like when I I just think like unlawful justice and like that's what we made the movies for was to make fun of action movies. And I always forget that Desert Sands is a much more like just because like we're in the same universe. I forget that we have movies with totally different like tones. Definitely, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Uh, first interview, I asked a question about Damien Senior having an accent, and I was like, "What's happening there?" And then Joe said, "What's happening is Darren Pitts." So did. Darren Pitts happen a lot. Oh, sorry. You're fine. You're fine. Did Darren Pitts happen a lot in this movie? Was it like a lot of like his own stuff that he was just doing on the fly? I want to say like in praise of Darren Pitts, magnificent. Every scene he's in, like he like hams it up as like Damien Sable Senior, and he is. In my, he's my favorite part of the movie. He's fantastic. Everything he does when he hits the cars on the way up the driveway. That weird thing he does with his hand, the yeah. big speech he does, he's so great. So did Darren Pitts happen a lot throughout the filming of this film? Darren Pitts was incredible, as we were saying, throughout the entire mm-hmm. thing. Basically, all I had to do with him, I said, hey, here's an outline of what's happening. You know, Here's the climate, the situation. Here's a general idea of what, what I want you to say. And then he would just go and take it away. Like, it was, like, wow. I don't know how he can come up with such clever things in his head, like Andrew Green dies for the last time. That's it's just such like, a good line. Like, on and that the fly. was improv, right? And that was the first That's crazy. That was the first take. Like, that was the first time we ever shot it. It was like I was like, this is perfect. Like, it's a little bit, little bit like dramatic. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like, but like that's exactly what we wanted. Like, it was, it was perfect. Darren, absolutely killed. He the did. Show. He was like truly amazing. I don't even know like how much of the first Desert Sands he watched because I remember when we went up to the barn to like shoot the scene. I was like filming him come again, and like this line where he goes, "I've come to burn." He Desert said, Sands. He goes, I've come to burn. Like, he pauses. He's like, like, you can tell his thing. He's like, I've come to burn the Black Hills. And then like he just all, took a shot. Yeah. Like, oh, my God. <laughs> make it, no. Yeah, no. Yeah. I don't. I think he watched it like once or twice, but he wasn't like. Yeah. He wasn't like fully invested. He was just uh-huh. kind of like watching for fun or whatever. And then he just decided. Like, I, I saw the potential in him. <laughs> <laughs> I see potential of you that I haven't seen anyone else. Um, any other soldier. <laughs> yes. But, um, like, because he was just so interested in doing that since he had never, I don't know, I don't think he's done many production things. So I think he wanted to see what it was like to get into that kind of yeah. production. And then just the way he acts. Yeah. And especially because he goes to a military school. He would just fit so well the yeah. part. Like, and, it just and, felt very real. Yeah, and he's a military leader. So it's mm-hmm. like, he has all the equipment. He knows the techniques and stuff. Like, if you look at, like, his form when we're fighting in the final scene, yeah. like, if you look at him versus me, like he just looks so much better, which is the the point of the whole scene. But like, yeah, like his physicality is like so real, but like his acting is like so over the top. It's fantastic. It's great. Like he like I, I like it has like nothing really to do, but like imp- like amazing performance by Darren Pitts. Definitely. I had a question about his. It's like part of the reason he's so great is he has half his scenes from the movie in a lawn chair, <laughs> and he's just sitting talking on the phone. Uh, now there's one scene in the beginning where like he's like talking to Kim, and he's like, he's like bring Andrew Green to me. Yes, was he laughing during that scene? I don't think so. Because I remember he's like he like smiles. He's like bring Andrew Green to me. Yes, alive. And like he's like, it's like I wonder if they made him laugh off camera. I don't think so. I mean that that was shot during the same day as the ambush scene, hmm. and that was shot after the ambush. So we were all just exhausted at that point. Yeah. We just oh, that was all shot done. the same day. Yeah, as I was saying before, like we compacted everything as much yeah. as we could, like. Yeah, so uh, I think, I don't know if he's laughing or not, but we were just trying to get everything done at that point. Do you remember the shot where, like, he's sitting in the chair, then it cuts, and he's doing this with his hand, he's got it like this? Did he want to do that? And, like, because, like, there's, like, like a, there's a jump cut, and then he's just going like this. Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, because you're kind of mad, you're, you're upset, so he was trying to convey he was upset, I guess, through body language. I don't know, but I think it was pretty funny. It was pretty good, though. Like, it was just... It was fantastic. I just wanted to, like, get all my Darren Pitt stuff out right there, because... Yeah. So good. Props to Darren. It, if yeah. we could have him in more movies, we definitely would. But oh, I, I would have loved to have had him in Unlawful Justice. I don't think he's all that interested in No, I don't anymore. think. But like... After seeing what it's like and how long it takes. So good, though. Yeah, he was he was great for what we had him for. I'm glad that we were able to get him in for... Even if it was for mm-hmm. a few scenes. 
So why was he in Czechoslovakia in the first place? Like, what was his goal? Like, why, like, why, like, did the Black Hills, were they always set out there? Did they, they move out there at some point? Like, what was going on there? I guess he moved out there because Black Hills originally was the Black Hills. Yes. In, in like, in the Scranton yeah. area that uh, we could all walk to. Uh, I guess he moved out there. Uh, the main reason we had him in check was because he mentioned it in the teaser. Yeah, a lot of a lot of what happens is because the teaser, pretty much. Did he improv Czechoslovakia in the teaser? <laughs> yeah. Oh my gosh. Oh, I, I think we might have. I don't know because he had the accent. You know what I mean? Okay. So yeah, I think we kind of had some idea. That but the teaser, fantastic. the teaser was also him improv, just saying whatever yeah. came to his head, and that was like the third try. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it's, it's just so good. Now, when we talked about it, you said most of the movie was set in Czechoslovakia in the first interview. This was your quote. You said most of the movie will be set in Czechoslovakia and a few scenes will come back to familiar places. I think it's fair to say like 75% of the movie is set here. So what places. what changed? Uh, yeah, I think because the original idea was to have Joe get re- getting retribution from me. So he was okay. supposed to be chasing around Damien Sable in, yeah. throughout Czechoslovakia. Okay. Or the Czech Republic as it's formally yes. known. Um but the yeah. Czech Republic and Slovakia. Yes. But uh we're using we use Czechoslovakia as a reason for him to be sleeping. Yeah. You're not smart in your sleep. But um yeah, the, the original idea for the second movie was to have a Pexy following Damien Sable throughout the country, looking mm-hmm. for him, searching for him any way he could, trying to kill him. Got it. So uh, we kind of touched on these next couple questions. Like I, I asked about like the Black Hills not being in the second movie, but I think we kind of answered that. I think it just changed throughout production. And we kind of touched on why Betty and Jonathan didn't have that much screen time in the movie, per se, because they're really not in it that much. So I'm going to go to my next question. It's about Andrew. There's really no easy way to put it. Why does he always lose in fights? <laughs> um, because like he obviously gets shot in the back of the head in the first movie. Constance beats him up. He runs away from the gunfight. The first fight he wins is at the end, and even then he needs help with Oliver, and then Jeffrey beats him again at the end. So what was... It's so rare to have an action hero, the main character of the movie, lose all his fights. So what was the thought process? Basically, I think this ties a lot in with the whole ending sequence and all that, so I don't know if you want to get into that right now. Or if you have other questions, I think we, we can hold. Before. I think we can hold off on that. Okay. I, 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 the ending, I think, has to be like a separate thing. Yeah. So I'll touch on that when the ending comes in. So keep that in the back of your head. Okay. But that that's something that I, we have to talk about when it comes to the whole. Because I need everything to explain. The whole okay. Thing. Yeah. So why didn't Jonathan go with you to Czechoslovakia? Well, in the script, what happened was we had a set day that we were going to go to Darren's uncle's farm. Okay. Because that was where the whole final scene was supposed to happen. And Joe was busy that day, probably had something to do with college or internship or something like that. And he couldn't go that day. So we said, okay, we got to figure out some reason that he can't go. Some, okay. And then he was like, oh, I got to protect Betty. I love that part. Just I mean, it kind of makes sense because they were just attacked. Uh-huh. So he has to stay home and hold it's down very the fort. Fun. Like he's like gives it this whole big spiel. And then he's like, I had to test you to make sure. I think it kind of works with the character of Apexi, though. It's just funny. Yeah, the, the snakeskin salesman, as your dad always uh-huh. references. Yeah. That. But, um... Uh, I think yeah. it worked more with, like, the character of Apexi that was in the Unlawful Justice movies than, like... Because, like, Desert Sensei's much more, like, brave. And Unlawful Justice, like... I don't know why I did that. Well, I, I could tell you that. That that, uh, that all culminates in the, in, the, in the ending as well. Okay. So I have all that covered. But, um... Uh, that's good, because I don't even have a cover. <laughs> no, I, I wrote it. I got that, man. I, I've, I've watched things, and I've figured out what makes sense, and... It's it's hard, especially because we didn't incorporate all that into the actual movies uh-huh. that we have to do in this interview. Yeah, but at the same time, I think if you if you watch things close enough, you could kind of tell what's happening. So the whole movie, like the scenes, like flow very nicely together. I think like all of them. There's one that bugs me because it kind of sticks out like a sore thumb. What was the purpose of the scene that of Darren capturing that Czechoslovakian soldier? Because like realistically, like it's not even really a gunfight. It's them capturing one guy. And then, like, he turns on them. Was it just because, like, that guy was wearing a uniform that day? Or uh, I think just, like, someone wanted to shoot the scene? Um, it's not a bad scene. It's just, like, it kind of sticks out as, like, why is this here? But yeah, when it comes to transitioning through all the scenes, I think we could have done a lot better. It is a little choppy, I'd think. But when it comes to that one, I don't know. I think we just... I, I, I think if I... Remember correctly, Darren only had a certain amount of uniforms. Okay. Or no, no, no. Nathan, the actor for the guy, he didn't come dressed 
as we wanted him dressed. We wanted like, the black outfit. Yeah. So Darren had to give him one of the jumpsuits. And it's like, well, who would be wearing a jumpsuit? You know what I mean? When yeah. everyone else is wearing black. Yeah. So it only made sense for him to be a soldier and okay. taking over. Well, that, well I, I was always just like, because like, it, like, it worked. It's a fine scene. It's like, it sticks out. It's like, yeah. what what are you doing in here? This doesn't really like belong. I, I think it was just because he, he wore like a bright red shirt and it was like, yeah, we need black, man. So you just suited up. I like, remember, there, uh, I don't know if you ever noticed in the background of that shot, there's another one of the, the guy who wears the red shirt who kills Constance later on is in is in the background of one of the shots. Oh, he's a different guy. But yeah, yeah, he's, yeah, he's, yeah. he's out there hiding out. Yeah. And I, I was like, that's a really good touch, Jack. Good work. Thanks, man. Ah, uh, that's that one. Let me see. Okay, no, no, no. Okay. So, oh, no, no, I asked that one too. So, can you just explain to everyone, I know why it happens. Can you explain the location change uh, in that final fight scene, just so everyone can hear it? Yeah, I meant to say it actually last question, but we had everyone set to go to the barn and the, the farm on that one day, and it rained, and his uncle just wouldn't let us use it because... He has this tractor that we were going to be driving around on that you came around us with. Yes, very and cool. It would have just been impossible to drive through all the mud and to get to all those locations with the tractor. So we had to think on the fly that this was like probably like a week before the movie was released. So we had to get that scene done. And we had everybody. And it's hard, as we mentioned in the last part yeah. of the interview, it's hard to get people to come and help you out well, for like, free. It's like, oh, it's almost like impossible like, to like get a bunch of guys in the same day. So, yeah, so we had them, and we were like, well, we just got to figure out, you know, garage looks kind of like a barn. It's yeah. the next best thing for what we have. Because yeah. uh, like, I, like, I knew that, like, I'm not trying to like put you on the spot with that, but I just like, I think everyone like kind of like wanted like an ex. It works with the dream thing, but like, I think it's like a, just like a good thing to explain. Yeah, I wish, I wish we could have gotten the farm. The farm would have been so much better, but... Mm-hmm. So probably good to mention here, when Andrew goes to Czechoslovakia, helping him instead of Joe is Oliver Sable, the Thanderpuss, played by Alex Obershinsky. Am I saying it right? Obshinsky. Obshinsky. Close enough. So sorry. Sorry. Um, is helping him there. Very cool shot, by the way, with you guys uh, walking out of the house. That's my brother's favorite shot of the whole movie. Yeah. Um, but he is there helping Andrew. Like they're kind of like loosely together the whole time. He shows up at the end, saves them, and then he's like, "I kind of like it here. I'm gonna stick around." And then he goes, "Oh, by the way, good luck with Damien when you find him." And Andrew's like, "What?" And he looks back and he's gone. Why? Why did that happen? It was another hint of the dream. Okay. Um, because at that point we were getting towards the end, and the dream was kind of maybe falling apart in the sense, okay. like when you start waking up from a dream, things just stop making sense. So when we get to the ending part, I get like when we when I explain what happened in the very end. I guess it could be chalked up to like things were just kind of like, like Andrew Green was waking up in real life kind of, and just things were kind of going wrong when it comes to Snake Eyes yeah. and Apexi. I'll explain what that means later, but like, yeah, w- things were like things were starting to go wrong in the real world, so like that happened. Okay, and he's just like what? But like, it didn't mean anything to Andrew at the time because he didn't know. So and no one else really knew. Andrew gets back to the U.S. He's like twenty three missed calls for the cat. It's better put. I always thought it was like a video. I was like, this reminds me of like a video game cutscene. Whenever I watch it, I'm like, this is like Modern Warfare. So you go in there and you find out about that. Storm off angrily, which is like kind of like I was like, like looking back now, it's like, well, I guess I'll mention this, but like we're gonna talk about it. But like looking back now, it's like this is the last Desert Sands interaction between. Jonathan Apex and Andrew Green, which is like sad looking back on it, but like we'll get to like that at like the end. You go to the Black Hills, Damien's there, he confronts you, he like takes you down. This is my last question before we talk about we have to unpack a lot with this ending. Why does Damien do what he does for this girl? Just because he's in love with her. As you say, as you say, if you're not willing to kill and die for the ones you love, you're not really a man. So he He's so in love with this girl that is supposed to have like cancer or some terminal illness that he goes out and he starts killing people for, her. you know, he's taking all their money and sometimes he won't get with the money. So he just kills him. But in his head, it's justified because he's like, with this money, I'm going to help save my girlfriend, you know? So he's just, he's so, so in love that he's willing to do all these terrible things. And I think that the kill and die is, it's like good to an extent, you know what I mean? If you wanted to like live off of that, like it kind of makes sense. But that's kind of the flaw about Damien is that he just takes it way too far. Yeah. Like, you know, in self-defense to kill somebody because you're just trying to save somebody you love. But, like, to go to Czechoslovakia and murder villages, you know. And that kind of adds to the whole 
like who do you follow kind of thing. Cause like, well, let's talk about that now then before we talk about this ending. Can you talk about what's going on with the theme of logic versus passion? Well, that has to do with the end. Well, let's just jump right in the ending then. Okay, so, well, before we jump into the ending, let's take a minute to thank our sponsors. Oh, boy. I don't know who's going to come on this time. I was not expecting two, sec- or two cuts, but thanks to whoever this next video is going to be of. Thinking about starting a podcast? As I'm sure you know, it can be tough, and there's a lot that goes into it. And the last thing that you should be thinking about is how to get your podcast out there. One of the biggest challenges new creators face is trying to find a reasonable way to upload their podcast to mainstream stores like Apple and Spotify. Well, if you're in that boat, look no further. Anchor is a free website that lets you distribute your audio files to pretty much every platform imaginable. They offer editing and recording tools on their website and on your phone. And the kicker, you can make money from your podcast with no minimum listenership. So what are you waiting for? Download the Anchor app today for free or visit anchor.fm to get started. All right, welcome back. Thanks to you. All right, whoever was in that video, let's get right back into things. This will be it. Let's knock this out. So the ending. Uh, Jay, just take it away. The only question I really want you to answer, obviously talk about logic versus passion, but like, I think people need to have this ending explain to them. So the only question I really have in this area is when did you decide to make this whole thing a dream? Pretty much when we wanted to introduce Andrew Green into the G- GRC- GRCU. GRCU. Yeah, the Green Ridge Cinematic Universe. Once I realized I had to keep him alive and that uh, we needed him for those movies, I was like, okay, how are we going to do this? Because he got shot in the back of the head. Like, yeah. What's a reasonable way to have him survive that? And it's just like, well, it's getting the parietal and like sip it a little. <laughs> but, but no, but because it's a dream, you can't die in your own dreams. Yeah. So easy enough that way. But all right. Is it time for me to monologue here? Uh, let's see we... I'm just going to sit back. This is you. All right. Let's see how this works out. I've been, I've been trying to think about how to explain this for so long. I tried to do it really fast at the premiere. Yeah. And that didn't oh, work all right, at all. I, I'll never forget like Joe giving you the hook during that premiere. He's like, no. Oh my God, I want to explain. All right, all right. So here, if you guys made it this far, thank you. This is this is what you've been waiting for. This is what I'm going to try to help explain. So let's start off by giving everybody a chronological view of the GRCU. Yeah, spitting up bars there, Ryman. Uh, <laughs> um, so if you haven't seen Unlawful Justice one and two, then this is going to make not as much sense. If you also haven't seen Inception, then this won't make as much sense either. But if you've seen all those movies, then this will be much easier for you to understand. I feel like if you made it this far, you've at least seen Lawful Justice. So, the end credit scene from Lawful Justice 1, the original, it shows Captain Apexy recruiting Andrew Green to Snake Eyes' militia yeah. the, just, the, just Snake Eyes. It's just like Snake the Eyes. Thing. So, and then the end of Desert Sands Retribution is the same exact scene. So, chronologically speaking, Lawful Justice 1 happens. And then in between... The end of the movie and then the end credit scene is pretty much all when Desert Sands and Desert Sands Retribution happens. Mm-hmm. And then those sync up the very end. And then Lawful Justice 2 happens right after that. So to explain the real world, the real world is Unlawful Justice. That's that's the real world. Andrew Green is this crazy militia bounty hunter. Yeah. Very deadly. Don't want to mess with them. Could take out SEAL Team 6 in his sleep. In his sleep, Yes. Okay, and then uh, I guess him and Apexi were friends growing up. Mm. So they made the high school friends, whatnot. Maybe they, they tra- I guess what makes sense is they trained together early on in yeah. their lives. I just want to make sure this is recording. Okay. Um, they trained together early in their lives, and they wanted to make Desert Sands their militia. Yes. But that never happened. So when Andrew Green asks Jonathan about that in Unlawful Justice 2, he says, like, oh, that's a thing yeah. of the past, whatever. That well, act- I always figured like it like happened like just like failed like it just didn't work. Yeah, so that, that's pretty much what happened. It didn't work. Either they did it and it didn't work, or it never happened. It didn't work out, and they went their separate ways. So Snake Eyes, after his first loss to Jericho in the first uh-huh. movie, he wants to recruit Andrew Green. So Jonathan and Pexy gets him. They have their own previous ties, so he can get him in the room, and they perform Inception on him. So basically, they put him to sleep, and they go two layers deep. Yeah, spitting up bars still. <laughs> um, <laughs> so in the in the first the very top layer, so your first layer of sleep, that's Jason Arden and Joe Guido. 
So in reality, those are our real names, but yeah. that's they're made up names. I think we should say now, though. Please, please go watch Inception if you haven't seen it, because this is not gonna, still not gonna make any sense. If yeah, that's true. If you um, this probably take ten minutes to explain, but if you watch the two and a half hour movie, yeah, then it'll be worth it. But um, I'll try to explain so that everybody can understand it, because that's what we need to do. Mm-hmm. So basically, we have the real world: Andrew Green, Jonathan Apexi. And then one layer under that. So you go to sleep, boom. We have Jason Arden and Joe Guido. And that's when they're in the interview. They're all wearing the suits for the last few minutes of Desert Sands Retribution. And then one layer under that. So Jason Arden in his sleep is Andrew Green again. Yeah. And that's the Desert Sands movies. So what's basically happening is Jonathan Apex is manipulating in some way Andrew Green to make him the opposite of what he really is. Yeah. He's just some low life. Late to his interviews wearing slides and on matching, mm-hmm. whatever. The Andrew that we see in the first and most of the second of the Desert Sands movies. Yes. So what happens through that is that Jonathan Apexi becomes like his best friend again. So he mentors him. He trains him again. He says, I see the potential in you that no one else sees so they can get close to each other. And what Jonathan Apexi really wants with Snake Eyes is to figure out what kind of thinking is... Uh, Andrew Green going to be using. So we talk about passionate and logical thinking when he wakes up in real life. So he wakes up, if he's thinking logically, then he's going to see through the lies of Snake Eyes. He's mm-hmm. going to say, you're a terrorist, you know, you're trying to kill innocent people, create chaos or whatever. Yeah. But if he wakes up and he's thinking like, hey, I'm open, I, you know, whatever, he's thinking more passionately, just like, this is what I love doing, I'm a bounty hunter, this is what I do. Because Andrew Green still has a heart, as we see in Unlawful Justice too. Yeah. So, But if he's just thinking like, oh, I'm a bounty hunter, let's just do it. This is mm-hmm. what I love doing. So that's where that passionate versus logical debate comes in. Apexi wants to see what kind of thinking he's going to wake up with. So that Snake Eyes knows, like, okay, I can do it now. Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it's so hard to explain. So basically... You're doing a good job. It, it, it's, it's working, I think. Overheated. Oh, God. What... We gotta restart this. I did. I had no idea that the cameras could overeat. Uh, you want to just keep this as a podcast? I, I, you can keep going. I want to just. I don't even know. No. Nah, okay. I might as well just keep going. So right now your video is just gonna be Thomas. Wave hi. Maybe we just cut the. All right. Wait. Wait. How about we just do this? Hey guys. Since it's gonna be me talking for a while. Yeah. Online, Jay's okay. just gonna explain this to you. So. Yeah, sorry for this technical difficulty. I didn't know the cameras could overheat like this. <laughs> well, we've been going. That's true. We've been shooting 4K for an hour. Okay, so where was I at? What was the last thing I just said? Uh, we were talking about uh, Apex is trying to figure out how Andrew thinks. Right. So he's trying to figure out whether it's going to be passionate or logical. So throughout the entire second movie, he's trying to make sure that he starts thinking passionately. It's like, hey, man, like, your mother's dead. You got to think with your heart, you know? Yeah. Um, these people are dying over in Czechoslovakia, man. You got to, like, go out and help them. You know, like, a logical person's like... This militia, we can't take on a militia. Like you saw, Andrew was saying, yeah. he's like, we can't take him on. But Apex, he's like, we gotta go do it. Yeah. As he goes through, and then even with Damian Sable, like Damian Sable Jr., this the son is another plant in his head, trying to fight against him to almost like he's the passionate thinker, and he's who Andrew's supposed to look up to. Like as we see in the first movie, like Andrew's looking up to Damien. Yeah. As he's like, oh, you're 17 and are you doing all this? Mm-hmm. So Damien is supposed to be like a model, not a model citizen, but like a model agent? militia agent. Yeah. yeah. Like he's supposed to be what Andrew looks up to. Like he wants to be like that. So when we show Damien thinking with his heart, saying like, man, my girlfriend's dead. Like I got to go help her. You know, when we see him thinking like that, Andrew sees that and he says, I want to be like that. Andrew Green, the the dream Andrew Green. Yeah. So that's basically it. And then once we go, does that explain most of the whole Desert Sands? Like the the. I, I think you're hitting. The, yeah, I, I think you're hitting like the beats you need to hit here. Yeah. Like, does that make sense to you? Is well, that makes sense to me. Yeah, but but is, like, is there any like questions you have about that one before I go to the next? No, I, I'm I'm good. So so then in the end, so we have them two pit against each other, and then we wake up and it's Jason Arden and Joe Guido, and then what happens there pretty much is. Uh, Apexi, but as Joe Guido, that's like the final test. It's like, how is this? How is he gonna think before he wakes up? How is he gonna be thinking? Okay. So Joe pretty or Apexi, but Joe Guido pretty much knows 
that they're going to have this interview and then he's going to have this idea in his head because he just woke up about the Desert Sands dream and he's a movie maker. She's so like, oh, let's just use this as a movie film. Okay. You know? So, so he tells the story about, do you want to follow someone who does all the right things but has the wrong intentions or do you want to follow the person that does all the right things but has the wrong intentions? And then he shows that he questions that and he says, do you really want to follow someone who has the wrong intentions? Basically saying that the version of himself in his dream was in the wrong the whole time. Yeah. Because he he joined Desert Sands because just to get some money. So mm-hmm. his mom wasn't bother bugging him anymore. Yeah. And then like he goes to Czechoslovakia because Captain Apexi says he's not a man. Yeah. You know, like he's realizing Jason Arden is realizing that everything that he was doing by thinking logically was wrong. Yeah. So he's like, all right, I'm done thinking logically. Passion. Time to start thinking about passion. And then in the very end, he says, it's time to follow my dreams. So he's basically saying that like everything that his dream was telling him about, it's time to not do that, you know, and time, okay. time to follow what my dreams were telling me. Time to think passionately. Okay. Then boom, Pexy and Snake Eyes take him out and and hire him for, for the uh, for Snake Eyes. A lawful justice too. A lawful justice too. So I hope that makes sense to you guys. Mm-hmm. I think if you... It might, it might, you may have to like watch it a few times and like yeah. listen to what I'm saying a few times. But I, I mean, think, if you haven't seen Unlawful Justice, that's gonna make no sense. You're like, that guy's what? So, he's not his friend. Yeah. But like, if you, if like you have, like, it'll make sense. Go watch Unlawful Justice. Yeah. I'll plug it. But Shame, um, shameless plug. But like, it makes like as a guy who's like seen both movies, like that makes perfect sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. So that's pretty much. And some people are like, oh, lame cop out for the dream. And like having a dream is kind of like a, a cop out, like oh, and yeah. it happened. But like I feel like it was one of the only ways. I don't know how else people would have would have done it. Especially because when you see Andrew Green as losing all of his fights, yeah, it's like how does he turn from that into, into this Andrew Green it's, in the lawful justice? It's a very different character. Even like your like one line at like the end of Unlawful Justice, just like groovy. groovy. Like that's not like that's not what you would say in like those yeah. movies. So, so like. This is a different guy. One of the only ways to explain that is to yeah. say it was all just a dream. It had, to, it had to come out like that. I think there were two possible things you could do. It could either be a dream or you could be like, it's a parallel universe. And I think people would have been much more upset if we were like, oh, this is parallel. It's another universe. Yeah. It's a multiverse. And it was cool to have everything in one universe saying that this is all, all these films are actually connected mm-hmm. for real. I think that was good. I'm sorry you guys can't see Thomas. This is That's, I mean it, it's reminded me of the first interview. The first, I mean, yeah. how many camera tools do we have in on that one There's like cats knocking over cameras and stuff. Yeah, it was crazy. And then we didn't know that they only recorded for yeah. half an hour. Oh my god. And the batteries were dying. Remember the battery died with the yeah. charger? No, I remember, I remember that it was like a half hour interview. It took us two hours to make. Yeah, it was crazy. Okay. And, so, and we couldn't even show you. Anyway. Well, we got the New York stuff. That well, right, but, the but whole, then like the two minutes in, portion. two minutes in, somebody goes, Tom, you, you went, Thomas goes to Scranton prep. I was like, all right, I guess there goes that New York thing. That's true. I meant to mention that in the beginning of the video. Hey, man from <laughs> New York, interview guy. Okay, so let's talk about okay. the elephant in the room. Uh, I, I, oh, Jesus, I just knocked my microphone over. I hate to talk about it because, like, I, I it's still like processing, but I think for anyone watching this, it's going to be the elephant in the room in the moment we've all been waiting for. Sadly, Desert Sands Three is not. Ah, oh God. Sadly, Desert Sands Three is not going to be happening, as we know from your latest update video. And like, I like, I've ta- I talked to you outside of these. Like, I kind of like knew it was gonna like happen, but like, I really like. I was like, he'll find a way to like do it. Like, he'll figure it out. But like, when you said it, I was like, oh, like I was like, that's it. So like, the Desert Sands and. In Unlawful Justice 3, I mean, we'll have to see if Andrew Green... will Unlawful Justice 3, that, that is coming out sometime uh, this year. We'll have to see. Andrew Green, will he be back? What's he doing in that? But the fact that he is not going to be, like, in Desert Sands movies anymore, even if there was only going to be one more, is just like, I can't believe it. Like, it's the movie that started it all. So, like, can you, like, take us through, like, what happened and what it was going to be? Yeah, so, like... I- to start things off, I mean, yeah, it sucks. I announced it before, but for those of you that didn't watch the update video because it didn't have to do with Desert Sands, it's like, it was already officially announced, but Desert Sands 3 won't be happening. And as I was talking about, like, to have a movie based around Apexi, like, it was going to be hard to begin with. And I had some ideas for the third Desert Sands movie, but, like, you know, now we're both college students. I work a job and then, like, a part-time gig, pretty much. He has a girlfriend and he's an architect student, so he's always working throughout the summer and all that. So it would have been pretty much impossible 
to try to shoot a third movie and to and to make it good. That we we might have been able to pull it off, but it just wouldn't have been what we really wanted. Yeah. And and it was going to be tough. I think it was going it would have been nice for the whole uh universe to try to explain all the things I just talked about. Like yeah. it, it would have helped with that, but other than that, it pretty much would have been fan service at that point and we just didn't want to do that. Did planning begin at all for a third movie or was it like after the second movie did you kind of think you were done or like what was the thought process? We wanted a third movie especially after seeing how much we improved from 1 to 2 and we always kind of saw it not as a competition but like a friendly like thing between with you guys yeah. like it was yeah, like yeah. we made Desert Sands then you guys made Unlawful Justice that was a little better than Desert mm-hmm. Sands and then we tried to make the second movie better than your first movie and then you made your second movie better than our second movie that's a lot of information right there. But like we wanted Desert Stands 3 to be better than Lawful Justice 2. Mm. And so we, we did want to do it, but uh, we didn't we didn't get that far into planning. We took a while off, and then I started writing some things, and it just kind of fell apart. I had a few different... I I, had, I think I had a very very general outline of what I wanted the movie to be like. Can but, you give us like a, like, a gen, like, a, like a general, general, like, what was the thought going into it? Yeah, so it was going to be in the real world. Yeah. With a Pexy and Green. Uh, it would have taken place mostly, or at least partially in Philly, because Joe had a condo down there before the virus hit. And it was gonna be it was gonna start out right before a pe- or right before Snake Eyes calls him to mm-hmm. track down Green and perform inception on him and all that. Yeah. So it was gonna start off like that and then Joe was gonna have a girlfriend, but I don't think it was gonna be Betty. I think Betty was gonna be in it. It, it was a very general and it's been a while since we've even reviewed that. But, um, and then it was going to have Snake Eyes convincing him to, before, yeah. you know, and, and then there's going to be a few scenes with uh, a different militia that I had. Uh, I had one actor for, Kyle Wargo. I don't know if you know him. Uh, I'm shout a, I'm out Kyle Wargo. Do. A lot of the Desert Sand squad, we all know Kyle. He was going to be like his own militia leader that was going to attack Joe on several occasions. Okay. And then I was going to be in there and I wanted to kill Joe. And then in the very end, I think in the very end, it's supposed to be like, oh, Andrew Green came around. He's not going to kill Joe anymore. And then I, because I kill Kyle. Yeah. And then I go and I kill Joe. Okay. And then, I don't, I don't know. It was going to be like very dramatic. It, it, had we done it, it would have been like super dramatic because it would have been a Catholic yeah. Pepsi dying. But, because uh, Andrew Green needed to live for the, the yeah. awful justice. But I think that was pretty much it. It was very general. Cause like I was gonna like I was gonna like like give you guys like that car that like when he gets shot in like Unlawful Justice too. I was gonna like I was like okay, you can like crawl out of there. That was gonna be. Yeah, that was oh yeah the opening was supposed to be then I forgot yeah so the opening to unlawful or to Desert Sands three was supposed to be, um, right after we met with the president in yeah. Unlawful Justice two, and it was gonna be like oh man like I'm done with this it was gonna make a voiceover and it was like I'm gonna walk through the city looking at stuff like man I wish I could just appreciate the world and not have to go around killing people all the time, and then I walk across the car and I hear him screaming mm-hmm. in there, and then I open it up, and it cut the black. So, like, anyone knew that he was in there, but, like, if you just watched the third movie, you wouldn't, you'd be like, well, what's yeah. in the trunk? But, like, everyone that was a hardcore fan would know that it was Joe in there. And, and then there'd be some other stuff. I think it was going to cut to that, and then from, from there, it was going to cut back to Philly, as I was telling you about. Yeah. And then lead up to why Joe was in the car. You're, you're bringing back some memories of what was going on because yeah. he was in the car. But, yeah, it, it, I think it would have been pretty okay. Like, I think the beginning would have been really nice. But yeah, it was just well, hard it was to... Yeah, it have been a nice, nice tie-in. Yeah, it was hard to really... But Get all stuff. I guess the, the so the Desert Sands film series is that end here. It's done. Yeah, it ends with you're still here. Uh, go uh, if you're gonna go out, go out with Ferris Bueller. Yeah, right. So this is long enough, and I had like I was like, oh, what future projects are you working with? But I'm just gonna wrap it up just because we've gone for a while. Maybe we have our own podcast of our on our own at some point where we talk about that stuff. I, I think we have to. Because if we do, I mean, we have some stuff in the works, like right now. Like, yeah, no offense to the Blitz Boys, but <laughs> this is so. Un- I think we have more to talk about. You know what I mean? Well, we just have like we like we have like a lot to like tell people about. I think like upcoming stuff. Yeah. So, I think I think we will have Thomas on again at some yeah. point. Definitely. That'd be great. Yeah. But I do have I have one more question. All right. And it's another quote from the first interview. Um. You said when we talked about the sequel. You said that this was going to be by far better than the first movie. After all of it now, a year and a half down the road from the sequel, three and a half years after Desert Sands came out, yeah. do you think that's true? Definitely. 
you know, as we've talked about before, with different kind of action cuts, even the dialogue in itself is a little better. There's less less sitting down and just talking in wide shots, you know, and more action happening and more cuts. They call them J cuts. Yeah. Where the audio kind of goes over the video a little bit. Yeah. Where it goes back and forth. A lot of that, better camera work, better equipment to begin with. You know, like we had we had the DSLR at that time, where the, fir- the whole first movie was shot on like an iPhone 7. Uh-huh. You know, and it was like okay, but you can tell a huge oh, difference. Oh, you can always tell between like a real camera and an iPhone. Definitely. So the, the whole second movie was filmed on the DSLR. So yeah. all those things combined, yeah, I think it definitely was a huge improvement. And I would have liked to have seen what we could have done with these cameras. I would have too. And Desert Sands 3. But... As we have more to talk about in the next podcast, these cameras will be put to use. We're not going to say anything now. Yeah. But these cameras will be put through some good use when it comes to production work very shortly, I hope. Yeah. So are you, just to wrap it up, are you, now that we know it's over, over, and there will not be a third movie, and maybe we see Andrew Green again in Unlawful Justice 3, maybe we don't, are you happy with where you leave this series? Kind of, you know, like I think it would have been nice because we were going to call it Desert Sands Resolution. Yeah. Because it sounds like retribution, but it also means resolution. Uh-huh. I think it would have been nice to have like everything wrapped up nice and pretty. But at the same time, it is kind of nice to leave it vague. I feel like it might leave more room for conversation. Yeah. Um, sometimes it's good not to explain things. You know, you see sequels where they just start explaining different backstories, and it's like, well, I didn't want to hear about that. I would have, yeah, like, like kind of rude like, sometimes. Sh- like little shot at Disney here, like when they start explaining the backstory of Han Solo, <laughs> it's like, oh, I liked, I liked the vagueness of Han Solo, you know. But they started giving him, yeah. they gave him his own movie, and it's like, well, now there's nothing really left to question. But you know what I mean? So I think, I think in that aspect, maybe it's 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 a good spot to leave off on. But to be completely honest, I wish we could have. I wish everybody was more committed to film. Yeah. And I I get it. You know, we all have what we love, we want to do. It just didn't line up. And that's just how life is, especially in this area, unfortunately. But, and especially with homemade YouTube movies. Yeah, exactly. So, to answer the question, no, I'm not happy, but I'm content with the situation in itself. Hey, at the end of the day, you got two great movies to look back on, and they'll always be there. Always be there. It'll always be nice to look at the GRC, GRCU. <laughs> you. I keep messing that up. All right, Jay, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for coming all the way from New York. <laughs> <laughs> um, I hope you guys enjoyed watching this. I'm speechless, man. This is this a pretty great interview. Yeah, it went say. really well. It was really great. Thanks for watching. I guess I'll see you guys in the next one.